No. Okay, no, no plot, no character development, not even vibes. There are no vibes to be found. These are the men we're thirsting after? My list of grievances just keeps getting longer and longer. Will Schuster was enough for society. I don't need this will too. Do I have faith that it will improve? No, I have faith that it will get worse. Hello, hi, welcome. <laughs> Today I'm doing another reading experiment where I'm going to read five books that I said that I would never read. A few months ago this idea popped into my head and I just thought it sounded kind of funny and then I started compiling a list of books that I both publicly and privately said that I never wanted to read and I wanted to try reading them to see if my judgment of them was correct, to see if I really do know my reading tastes that well and to know if I really won't like these because I've already assumed I won't like them or to see if any of these books might surprise me because you kind of never know. So I want to make it abundantly clear before we get into all of these books. I'm not reading these just to hate on them. I actually don't think it's wrong to hate read for fun. I think it's actually really fun and entertaining. People seem to get really upset when you hate read books for some reason, but no one seems to care if you hate watch a TV show or movie. I don't really know why there's a double standard when it comes to those two things, but for the purpose of this video I do want to make it clear that I was not reading these books to hate on them. I was reading these books to see if my assumption about them and my assumption that I wouldn't like them was correct or not, and I wanted to try giving something that I said I'd never give a chance a chance just to see what happens. I already know I'm gonna get a lot of hate comments on this video because of some of the books that I'm talking about, so I'm just gonna make this clear again. If you don't like hearing people say negative things about your favorite books, don't watch the video. You don't have to sit here and listen to me criticize something that you deeply love. Go read it, go enjoy it, go have a good time. I'm just here to give you my opinion on these five books that I read, plus some of these books are books that people have been asking me to read for a really long time, so I thought I will give you all what you want and I will read the books you've been asking me to read, so that's how we ended up here. <laughs> I do also want to say that every time I've done these experiment videos I've always made them spoiler free because I want anyone to be able to watch them even if they haven't read the books, except this video I decided to talk about the book with spoilers. One, because a lot of people asked me to do that with this one specifically. Two, a lot of these books are a lot older and they're really really popular so I think most people have read most of these. And three, it was just really hard to make my points if I didn't talk about spoilers. So if you haven't read any of these books or one of these books and you don't want to be spoiled for what happens, you can just skip over that book and watch the sections for the books you have read. Or if you don't care about being spoiled, you can just watch it with the spoilers because I have so much to say. It's a journey. This video was such a journey. It's me so long to make. I had seven hours of raw footage because that is how much I was talking. So yes, this video does have spoilers for all of the books. I know some people will be disappointed in that, some people will be really happy about it, but I tried to do what made the video I think the best it could be. Also super quickly before we get into the books, I do want to remind you all again that my reading journal, the A Clockwork Reader reading journal, is available at multiple different booksellers on Barnes & Noble, Amazon, independent bookstores, Book Depository if you want to get it internationally. If you love reading and you love journaling and you want a physical way to track the books that you read that's also aesthetic and fun and creative, then this is perfect for you. I've already started filling mine in um, with the books that I've read for the year and I've been doing some fun spreads. This is one for five centimeters per second, which is one of my favorite books I've read this year. I've been having a good time filling mine in and I've loved seeing all of your spreads and um, your photos of the journal. So thank you so much to anybody who is using it and who's sending me their photos and posting about it. The links to purchase the A Clockwork Reader reading journal are in my description box as always, so be sure to check it out there. But that is everything I have to say in this intro. I'm trying to keep it as brief as possible because this video is already absurdly long. So grab a snack, get comfortable, and let's get into to me reading these five books I said I would never read. Alright, so first up on my list of books I said I would never read was Red Queen by Victoria Aveyard. Red Queen is a dystopian fantasy novel that takes place in this world where there are people who are red-blooded and silver-blooded. The reds are like the lower classes of people and the silvers are the elite class who also have like supernatural abilities. And our main character is a red and then one day discovers that she has superpowers like silvers even though she doesn't have silver blood. This is one of the books that people have been asking me to read for years and years and I have always said I don't want to read it because I don't really like YA dystopian very much. I like very few YA dystopian books so I have always said I'm not interested and I'm not going to read it but I finally read it. Hello everyone. You might be confused about where I am at the present moment and that's because I'm at my best friend Katie's house. These are her bookshelves. That's why everything looks different but I'm here to update that I have officially started reading Red Queen by Victoria Aveyard. This is also Katie's copy of the book and this video was heavily in 
inspired slash influenced by her decision <laughs> to make me read these because she wants to know my opinions on them. So you can thank her. But yes, Red Queen. I'm a little bit more than halfway through this right now. I'm on page 225. I'm pretty far into it, you know, I only have this much left. I don't have many thoughts, but I also think that's because the book doesn't have many thoughts. <laughs> Honestly, I will say, I think I'm actually enjoying this more than I thought I would. The main feeling I have about this book right now is that it's just deeply, deeply okay. Not much is going on. It's not very memorable. I am curious to see where it goes. Like, I'm not bored out of my mind. Like, I want to stop reading immediately because I hate it or something like that. But it really just, like, reads like every other YA fantasy of the early 2010s. I think this is probably one of those books that was too hyped up. There isn't anything that's like super glaringly wrong with it or anything, apart from the fact that the main character especially, like she doesn't really have a personality. She's just very 2010 YA protagonist. It's giving like Triss vibes. There's just nothing there. You could replace her with anybody. There's just very, very little development when it comes to all of these characters, honestly. I think it's just like the plot that's like a little bit intriguing. The fact that it's like a royal setting and everything. I like stuff like that so that part of the story definitely draws me in a bit more but like as a whole not much is happening. But yeah despite my criticisms um, I am actually enjoying it a lot more than I thought I would. I don't hate it at all. I don't really like it very much but I don't dislike it either. And it's just like fine to me uh, so far. It's really fine. But yeah I'll be back soon to let you know all my final thoughts. Okay hello everyone. I finished Red Queen. <laughs> This review is going to be completely unhinged. I'm at <laughs> you. What was I saying? You're saying hi. Hi. <laughs> if you hear someone else talking or laughing, it's because Katie is here. She's sitting in the back over here. That's her arm. We just watched Yuri on Ice before this and I don't think I can think straight anymore. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> You can think before. And that's but. true. Anyway, <laughs> this review is about to be pretty unhinged. One, because I'm a little bit delirious <laughs> and tired. And two, because this book is not very good. <laughs> this book was in some ways very straightforward, but in other ways kind of all over the place. I feel like it didn't know exactly what it was doing or what it wanted to do with any of the characters or the plot or anything. Actually, the plot was the best part. The characters, however, we'll get into that. I will say I was expecting to like completely despise this and just like think it was atrocious and terrible. I don't think that. I don't hate it at all actually. I was very intrigued like from the beginning and in my first update when I was about halfway through I was very interested to see where the story was gonna go but then as I kept reading it got progressively worse so <laughs> that wasn't the most fun but I was very invested in the plot so I definitely give it credit for that. It held my attention but as a whole I just don't think it's the best. <laughs> I think hands down the worst part of this book is just the characters because they're not characters. <laughs> they have no personality, they have no substance, they have no development. Each of them was just given like a specific role. For example, there was like the prince, like the older prince who was going to become king, Cal. There was the younger brother prince who was jealous of the older brother. There was the king. There was the queen who was like a little evil. Then there's the main character who's just thrust into this world and doesn't really know what's going on. There are the soldiers and then there are the rebels and like that's it they don't have anything else to them apart from that like one specific thing that was assigned to them they were all so boring and so just not memorable <laughs> the main character mayor molly barrow who i keep wanting to call mayor molly wheelbarrow <laughs> I have such a hard time saying this girl's name. It's, I think, probably the worst name I've ever heard for any main character ever. I don't think I can think of a worse name for a character. I don't think one exists. Tyvee was better. Tyvee? <laughs> So the king's name is Tiberius and there was a point where the queen called him like by his nickname which I think was supposed to be Tybe but I think it's Tybee. Tybee? Tybee. I'm pretty sure his nickname was Tybee. The nicknames in this were just like kind of wild. At one point Cal called Maven Mavy in like a really serious moment. He was like Mavy. Oh, growled no, actually, under his breath. Yeah and he growled Mavy under his breath. It was like he growled his name under his breath and his name was Mavy. Like, <laughs> How would you even growl the name maybe? Maybe. <laughs> Some of the dialogue in here was just, oh my god, it was so much. 
The thing is that this book really felt like it was written to be like a movie or a TV show or something. And I thought that as I was reading it and then I read Victoria Aveyard's um, bio in the back of the book and she literally went to school for screenwriting and she is also a screenwriter, which makes perfect sense because this really did read like a screenplay sometimes, even though it's supposed to read like a novel. There were just like so many fade to black moments where it was like supposed to be like a transition from one scene to the next. And like, I could picture it like a movie, but not because it was like so vivid with its imagery and it just like felt like a film, but because she like wanted you to feel like it was supposed to be a movie, but it just, it didn't land in my opinion. Also, I didn't really find any of the plot twists that... Twisty. Twisty. <laughs> really predictable and it's genuinely I don't think because I was like paying really close attention or trying to figure everything out I think it's literally because it was so obvious and because the main character is so dumb Mayor Molly Wheelbarrow <laughs> just doesn't know anything and she's literally just so oblivious to absolutely everything it's physically painful sometimes to read there's this one line like towards the end where they're like in their prison cell and Maven came to visit them and then she's like and this was just another plot you pushed me into this even though it was impossible even though you knew Cal would never betray his father. You made me believe it. You made all of us believe it. And then Maven literally says, it's not my fault you were stupid enough to play along. Like he's right. I know he betrayed her, but like it is not his fault that she was dumb enough to believe everything. I mean, his mother literally can read your mind and know everything about you that you've ever done, thought, heard, said, believed literally anything that's ever happened in your life she can read your mind and figure all of it out you really thought you would be able to be a part of some like secret rebel group while you live literally right next door to her you sleep next door to her like your bed your bedrooms are in the same hall and you really think you're gonna be able to actually get away with any of this how did she not put together that maven was a part of this the entire time like it just i don't understand <laughs> Oh, I found the big oak part. <laughs> Here's an example of what I mean when I say that um, the dialogue in this book was like really cringy. And sometimes it was also like a bit jarring because like she would just use like weird phrases and words that felt out of place. For example, this is like a really like emotional moment, like a like high stakes action packed like scene. And out of nowhere, she just like says, I grab Cal's shoulders trying to pull him up, but the big oaf doesn't budge. Like big oaf sounds like a weird phrase to use in that moment. I need a direct like quote of the slap slap. Oh, I'll find the slap scene. <laughs> We're gonna talk about the slap scene because <laughs> I cackled at this. I find this <laughs> so funny. <laughs> This is when um, we find out about Maven's betrayal and the queen and him like planning this entire thing out themselves and being behind everything. You know, the like peak of all of the drama in this book is like this scene. And the king, Tybee, <laughs> is talking to Maven and saying like, you're my son, nothing can change that, not even her, referring to the queen. And then the queen who is like controlling Cal and everyone else because that that's her power. I, I don't understand how the magic system in this world works. It makes literally no sense. But she says, dearest, I'm not doing anything. She chirps back, but your beloved boy, she slaps Cal across the face. The perfect air. She slaps him again harder this time. No, we have to reenact it. Oh my God. But your beloved boy. <laughs> your precious air. <laughs> That scene just like came out of nowhere. Like he's like on the ground or something. And out of nowhere, she decides to just walk over and be like. <laughs> How do you slap somebody who's on the ground? I don't know. Maybe he's not on the ground. I don't know where he is. Like things are not well described in this I'm book. On so the I was on the ground reading it. He's just standing there. And she just decides to go over there and slap him mid sentence while she's talking to somebody else. <laughs> It's comedic. It reads like it's supposed to be comedic, but I don't think it's supposed to be funny. Because <laughs> like I said, this is like the height of all of the action and the drama. Like it's the climax of the book. So like why on earth? Why on earth are we doing that and then calling someone a big oaf like one page later? The other thing was that the romance had like no buildup whatsoever. Cal and Mare had like 
no scenes together at all, especially in the beginning of the book. Like there was no reason for him to like her and there was no reason for her to like him. And it's not just because she was like super boring or that he was boring, even though they were both incredibly boring. There was nothing there, like nothing happened for them to like each other in the first place. You know what I mean? I don't think I've ever read a book where I felt so little the entire time. I didn't feel upset. I didn't feel like angry or even bored really. I didn't enjoy it though at the same time. I'm like I just I felt like almost nothing the entire time I was reading this. It's just deeply deeply fine deeply deeply okay. It wasn't fun for me to read necessarily but it's very like readable. It's um very quick to get through. It's not super long and I think the plot alone is interesting enough that it would keep you reading so it definitely has those things going for it but as a whole it's just so okay. So yeah this is a book that people have been asking me to read for so long. Like one of the top books I would say that people have been begging me to read is Red Queen. I'm not surprised that I don't love it it, but I am surprised that I don't hate it. So there is that. Anyway, that sums up pretty much all my thoughts on Red Queen. I would probably rate this like a 2.5 out of 5 because like I said, it was just okay. It's just okay. Okay? <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> Okay, the next book I said I would never read was The Selection by Kira Cass. This came out when I was a kid and I never read it back then because similarly to Red Queen, I don't like YA dystopian very much, which is why I don't read it. And the premise of this is basically just YA dystopian meets The Bachelor. I also don't like The Bachelor, so nothing about this seemed appealing to me. <laughs> but despite that, this is another book that people have been asking me to read for a really long time. So I finally read it and you can finally know my thoughts. All right, hello everyone. I am here to update you on my reading progress with the selection. The reason I never wanted to read this book, well, one of the main reasons I never wanted to read this book, which is going to sound incredibly petty, but I know other people agree with me because I have seen TikToks on this before. It's the fact that the main character's name is America. I do not care what you say. I hate the fact that her name is America. And I knew that before I started reading the book. However, I had no idea that her full name is America Singer and she is literally a singer. That is the worst thing I have ever heard. I said that Mayor Molly Barrow from The Red Queen was the worst name for a main character I'd ever heard, but I take that back. America Singer is the worst name I have ever heard in my entire life. If my name was America Singer, I would change my name from the time I was like able to speak. From the time that I was aware that my name was America Singer, I would have legally changed my name because that is awful. It's awful. Her parents, it, I believe in prison abolition, but electric chair. I know it's not like the whole message of the book, but it's like too patriotic and nationalistic for me. I can't deal with it. Putting her atrocious name aside, I pretty much hate everything else about this book too. Most notably, the writing. I don't think I've read a book with writing this bad since I read The Spanish Love Deception. <laughs> and you know what? I'll give credit to The Spanish Love Deception. I think that one was better written than this was because there were at least times where I kind of cared about the characters. This is really poorly written. It just jumps from like scene to scene sometimes with like no explanation whatsoever. And it kind of does what the Red Queen did a little bit in terms of like writing style, where it feels like it was kind of written with the intent of it being like a movie script, but it doesn't translate well because it's supposed to be a novel. So you need to give us like more exposition and like she just doesn't do that sometimes. And she'll just like jump from one thing to another without really explaining how we got there. They don't explain the selection very well at all. There's like almost no detail about it, about why it exists, about the whole process or anything. And at first I was like, oh, are we supposed to be kind of confused because we're supposed to go along with this journey that the girls are going on while they're in the selection? But no, they just like don't explain anything to you. She was like, you kind of know what the concept of The Bachelor is. So like, we just won't explain it. The characters are awful. Literally all of them are awful. I hate America Singer, one, because of her name, but two, she literally just doesn't have any personality. She's just some pretty redhead girl. Like that's literally all they describe her as the entire time. I don't like Maxim. All he's done so far, is just like talk to her a couple of times and then she like immediately confessed all of her feelings about Aspen the guy that she was like in love with before she came here who then was like no you have to go to the selection because I'm gonna be with someone else I can't bring you down the whole I'm a man I'm supposed to provide for you thing is just like heavily present in this and it's really uncomfortable why are you telling Maxim any of this you've known him for literally like probably three days I think you've had two conversations with him why on earth are you confessing all of your 
like feelings to him. Why did you even agree to help him out with this election in the first place? Like when she makes the whole deal, if you keep me here as long as possible, like I'll help you out with some of the other girls and put in like a good word for you. First of all, why would he need a good word? He's the fucking prince, okay? Everyone is here because they want to marry him. So he literally just doesn't even need you. Second of all, why don't you just like mind your business and just do nothing and say nothing and hide under the radar? Then you won't have to deal with any of this and your family will still be compensated for you staying here and you'll reap the rewards that this election will give you while you're there. Why on earth are you like getting involved with him at all? She's trying so hard to not draw attention to herself because people are already kind of rooting for her and she doesn't want people to be rooting for her. So instead of actually not drawing attention to herself, she decides to spend more time with Maxim. Explain? Also, this book gets really, I'm not like other girlsy, but in like the 2012 way. And I'm pretty sure this was published in 2012, so that makes sense. <laughs> She's not like that awful to the other girls or anything, but she is pretty judgmental of them. And the fact that some of them really like to wear a lot of makeup and she like doesn't wear a lot of makeup. She asks the uh, makeup artists and like the maids and stuff to like not dress her too extravagantly, not just because she's trying to not stand out too much, that's part of it, but also because she is kind of looking down on the girls who are wearing more makeup. And that's what I mean by it's like, I'm not like other girls, but like circa 2012, not too much. It's not like awful. I kind of expected it to be more um, intense than it is, but it's, it's really not like that bad, but it's definitely there. And yeah, it's just very much a product of its time, I think. Was I calling him Maxim the entire time? His name is Maxim with an N. I don't remember anybody's names. None of these characters are memorable. <laughs> I wish that this was more fun to read because I feel like in concept, it really just should be fun to read, but it's, it's not. The way she literally has to teach him what poverty is. <laughs> Personally, I'm not a fan of stories where some girl has to teach a man how to have empathy for other people. That's like my least favorite trope in existence. I don't wanna see it. That exists way too much in real life. I don't need to read about it in fictional romances too. And I know you're all gonna tell me to not read too much into it and that I just have to suspend my disbelief with this, but I only have so much disbelief to suspend. Okay, I can't, I can't keep doing this. <laughs> Do you know what America reminds me of? She reminds me of that TikTok sound that's like, I'm shy, I'm so shy. Like that's literally who she is. That's what I mean by this book has like, I'm not like other girl, like pick me vibes, like 2012 pick me vibes. She's like, I'm so shy. I hate being the center of attention. Oh my God, don't pay attention to me. And then like, literally creates a situation in which everyone will start paying attention to her. Like you really think that if you give the maids notes to pass to the prince, people aren't gonna start gossiping about you and the prince. You're not that dumb. There's no way she is that dumb. If she's that dumb, that that's even worse at that point. The number of times they like mention how long it takes the other girls to get ready and how it takes her like no time at all to get ready. Like girl, chill, calm down. You're not special. <laughs> I feel like this book just points things out to you way too directly and like doesn't trust the reader to actually understand what the book is trying to say. Do you know what I mean? Like she's trying to just tell you this is what I'm saying instead of like showing you what she's saying and assuming that the reader has enough critical thinking skills to be able to put two and two together. And I hate when books do that, especially when YA books do that because to me, it's kind of like insulting to the reader because it just assumes that you can't like analyze anything. Okay, Maxon did say tax the rich. So I'll give him credit for that. He did have to have America explain some imaginary scenario in which the girl he loved was like starving and dying and asked him if he would have to steal a loaf of bread. And it was his only option. And then that literally like made him so emotional that he was like, is that really how people live? And then he was like, okay, let's tax the rich. We love class consciousness. That's nice. That's good for you, Maxon. I'm, I'm happy for you. <laughs> oh my God. This is the story behind her name. While my mom was pregnant with me, I kicked a lot. She said she had a fighter on her hands, so she named me after the country that fought so hard to keep its land together. I hate it. <laughs> okay, please ignore the state of my hands. I'm in the middle of painting my nails. His full name is Maxon Screve. I don't even think I processed this earlier. I wasn't like paying attention to his full name. Screve, is that how you say that? That's an awful name. 
Why are all these characters named so terribly? Why would you choose? You can name your characters whatever you want. Why would you choose America Singer and Max and Screeve? If I heard those names, I would not want to be associated with those people simply because of their names, which I understand is pretty judgmental, but I don't care. I've gotten to know them too, and I also don't like their personalities. I have so many questions about this book, but most importantly, it's why were these names chosen? Not just the names for the characters, but also the names for like the countries and stuff. Swendway? What is Swendway? The king and queen of Swendway are coming to visit in three days. Swendway? This has the energy of the um, Christmas Prince movies on Netflix. That's what this is giving and not in a good way. Swendway is formerly Sweden. Why did you name it Swendway? <laughs> I just can't believe I'm reading a book where we're fighting over a man. We're literally competing for a man's affection. This is so off brand for me, it hurts. <laughs> I finished it. That was awful. Here's the thing. It's like, it's not offensive really, but it's potentially offensive to the art of writing and creating a novel. This was really bad. Like there was absolutely nothing in here. First of all, it's really short. And second of all, like nothing happens at all. This was literally just all set up, completely all set up nothing happens. Why would you even keep reading? The ending literally feels like it left off like maybe a quarter of the way through a book. I have no idea what's going on with the politics of this world. All they just tell you is that the North and South are fighting and they're attacking. Who are they? What are they doing? What is their objective? What is the point of any of this? I'm sure the other books probably explain more of it. There's no way that they don't. If you're gonna set things up in the first book, you at least have to tell us like what's going on politically in this world. Like they're just like the North and South are attacking and she's like, Max and I'm so scared. And he's like, I know. Okay. <laughs> it's no plot, no character development, not even vibes. There are no vibes to be found. Nothing is going on. I think this tries to take itself a little bit too seriously at times. And so it just doesn't work. I think it needed to lean into the like, this is over the top and like extra and over dramatic. That's the thing. It's not even like over dramatic or anything. Like I feel like this concept alone should make the book extremely dramatic and like funny. It's not funny. There's not a single joke in this book. Nothing has been funny, except for the fact that her name is America Singer and she sings. And the fact that there's a country called Swendway. Besides that, nothing about this is funny. And those two things were not meant to be intentionally funny. I can promise you that much. I feel like it's exactly what I thought it would be, but still somehow worse. Cause I really didn't expect to like this. I expected to actually kind of hate this and I did hate it, but I don't think I expected it to be as dull as it was. I should honestly make an entire video ranking older YA dystopian books because the selection will be at the very bottom of that list. This doesn't deserve to call itself dystopian. Nothing about this world is dystopian. It's literally just The Bachelor. The writing in here was really cringy. There was one point where she called him fancy pants, where she was like your fancy pants education or schooling or something like that. Oh, there was also that whole section where he like yelled at her, like he apologized at the end for this, but like he yelled at her. He's like, you forget yourself. It would do you well to remember that I am the crown prince of Aaliyah. For all intents and purposes, I am lord and master of this country. Pitch, calm down. And I'll be damned if you think you can treat me like this in my own home. You don't have to agree with my decisions, but you will abide by them. Disgusting, literally disgusting. The toxic masculinity in this was physically painful to read. And the fact that the entire book, the entire premise of the book and the entire plot of the book is just a bunch of girls fighting over this man who literally doesn't deserve any of them. A waste of my time, complete waste of my time. I hated reading this. <laughs> Out of five, I give this 1.5 stars. It's not the worst thing I've ever read, but uh, it's, it's up there as far as YA dystopian goes. I will also say that if you want something that's like the selection, but is actually good, go watch Snow White with the Red Hair. That show is amazing. And it has the same like energy, or at least the energy that the selection wants to have, but it's so much better. It has princes and princesses, castles, and like commoner girl who like becomes friends with the prince. And it's just the same like concept in some ways, minus the like bachelor part of it. There's good world building, great character development, and just wonderful characters in general. Go watch Snow White with the Red Hair. I promise you it's worth your time. It's such a good show. Highly recommend. Anyway, that's all I have to say about this election. I'm done. We're going to move on to another book because I can't take this anymore. <laughs>
Okay, moving on. The next book that I read in this video was From Blood and Ash by Jennifer L. Armentrout. I know Jennifer L. Armentrout has been a really popular author for years, even ever since I was really young, but From Blood and Ash has kind of just taken off, especially on Book Talk. It's basically just a new adult fantasy book that's like a little bit smutty, and I think that's why it's done so well on TikTok, because TikTok really loves fantasy and TikTok loves smutty books. Those have been kind of like two of the biggest book trends on there. The reason I said I would never read this was because I don't don't really care that much about new adult fantasy and based on what I'd seen the people who were recommending this were also people who were reading a lot of other books that I don't really like so I just really didn't have an interest in reading it also because I'd seen some friends give it bad reviews and because it's absurdly long I didn't feel like wasting my time however for the sake of this video I did in fact read it and I did in fact waste my time. All right, hello, you're getting this update while I get ready for the day. So I started reading from Blood and Ash. And by started reading, I mean I've literally only read chapter one, but I had to update immediately because I'm gonna hate this and I know it already. <laughs> I think this is the one that probably out of everything on this list I had the least expectations about because I genuinely have no idea what it's about. Like I'm not surprised that I don't like it, I'm just surprised that I don't like it this much already. I cannot explain why I just so clearly know this early on in the book that I'm just going to despise it. Apart from the fact that we're one chapter in and she has already said the word male body and female like four times. <laughs> I'm listening to the audiobook for this one and I can't take it. I cannot tolerate the whole male body, male presence, his male scent, her female hands. Like what do you mean? Use better descriptive words, my god. <laughs> if we're starting out with the gender essentialism this early on in the book, I really don't know how well I'm gonna fare for the rest of it. Like I just, I don't think it's gonna be a good time. Anyway, I'm gonna go read some more of it and I'll update probably soon. I'm on chapter two and we have already entered the questionable consent aspect of this story. I just know it's gonna get so much worse than this. <laughs> I feel like the point of this chapter is to give you like a little bit of a taste of where the rest of the book is kind of headed, which is smart because if it's not your thing, you can like dip out at this point, which would be the smart thing for me to do, but I'm making this video, so I'm not doing that. <laughs> A lot of you guys tell me to DNF these books if I'm really not enjoying them in these experiment videos. And while I do want to do that sometimes, I feel like I just have to finish it because I want to give like a full review of it. But I promise you with this one, if I get to a point where I just like really cannot take it anymore, I will DNF it. But for now, we are kissing people under false pretenses. And I feel like that's only going to be the beginning. The consent aspect of this book is definitely just going to get worse and worse. And I don't even know if this guy is the main love interest or not yet, but his name is Hawk. And I can already tell you, if you want a better Hawk to read about or watch, just go watch Yona of the Dawn or read Yona of the Dawn. Hawk in that book, he's great. I love him. Anyway, um, I promise I'm not going to update every single chapter. I just had to mention that right now, but I do promise that I will be updating a lot because there's no way I'm going to get through this without complaining about it. <laughs> Okay, no way, no way. Before I even get into this, um, I wanna say that I watched a TikTok about this a while ago, at least a few months ago, and I hadn't put together that it was about this book because I didn't know anything about the book, but it was from Marinez from My Name is Marinez, and she did a really great job of talking about this whole subject and explaining everything in this and bringing it to people's attention. So I'll leave it linked in the description box if you wanna go and watch it, it's definitely worth watching. But basically she pointed out the fact, and I just got, to this part in the book that the two characters of color in this book so far are named Kieran, which is Irish for black, and Tawny, which is literally like a brownish, orangish brown color. She literally named these two characters after their skin color. That's... <laughs> I, what do you want me to say? <laughs> Naming characters of color after the color of their skin has like a whole like history behind it. It is literally a method people have used to demean people of color and just reduce them down to their skin color, which is literally what she is doing by naming him Kieran and then making him the black character. Are you kidding me? <laughs> okay, hello. I'm like two hours into this 19 hour and 46 minute audiobook. It has not improved, but it hasn't gotten worse. I have to be honest though. I have no clue what the fuck is going on. <laughs> this 
is so confusing to me. And I think it's just because nothing is being explained. We were literally just thrust into this world, zero explanation. Like she's trying to explain some things, but my brain is retaining maybe 1% of it. And that's being generous. I feel like she just took elements of fantasy and was like, fantasy has magic and it has vampires, werewolves, shape-shifting, and like put it all in one and was like, there, it's fantasy. That counts, right? And like didn't explain anything. Like that's what this book feels like to me, at least. Do I have faith that it will improve? No, I have faith that it will get worse. Anyway, <laughs> I'm gonna go make my lunch and motivate myself to continue reading this by giving myself some good food because that's the only way I'm gonna have enough energy to finish this. <laughs> and then I'll come back and update whatever I have more to say, which honestly will probably be soon. Hi, hello. Okay, I'm a little bit more than halfway through at this point and I, I'm still suffering. <laughs> I know I said earlier that if I get to a point where I really just can't take it anymore, I will quit, I'll DNF the book. But Katie, who you all saw earlier in the video, has begged me to continue reading it because she really wants to know my opinions on the ending. So I'm literally only gonna finish it for her. Otherwise I would be quitting at this point because I don't want to read it anymore. <laughs> I simultaneously have nothing to say because nothing is going on. And also I feel like I could update every line because I have so many just like, complaints. <laughs> First and foremost, this book is way too long. I don't know how many pages it is. I'm going to look it up on Goodreads. Hold on. The ebook edition is 622 pages and the paperback edition is 613. So I'm going to go with 613 for the paperback edition. That is quite literally, I'm not even being hyperbolic. It's at least like 300 pages too long already. I'm probably like 400 pages into this book. I think you could already cut out 300 pages. It's just constant like info dumping and exposition that is completely irrelevant to anything that is happening. And what is happening? literally nothing. I cannot tell you what the plot of this book is. There is no plot to this book. There's literally no plot. Can anyone explain the plot of From Blood and Ash to me? Because it doesn't have a plot. And it's not even one of those like just vibes, no plot books. What are the vibes? There haven't even been enough kiss scenes. There has been one kiss scene in this book so far, which was in chapter two, which was under false pretenses. So he didn't even know who she was. And that is the only thing that has happened in the first more than half of this book. What are we even reading for at that point? And I think one of the main reasons why it is so absurdly long is that the book constantly repeats itself. Since I'm listening to it on audiobook, I can't like give you screenshots of it when she's doing it in the book, but I promise if you read it, you will notice this. It's at least once on every page where she'll say a, like a phrase, like it was dot, dot, dot. It was so dark, something like that. And she'll just like use ellipses like that. She'll be like the door, dot, 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 the door. Or like his hand, M dash, his hand was cold. Like, why are you constantly repeating yourself? It's so jarring when you're reading it. As I'm listening to it, I just like keep hearing it repeat itself. And I keep thinking that the audiobook has glitched, but it's not a glitch. It's literally just her constantly repeating the same phrases over and over and over and over again. It's insufferable. Like I just, I can't take it. The writing is so, I'm sorry, it's so bad. It's such a problem. Like it really just removes you from the experience of reading the book because like I said I keep thinking that the audiobook I'm listening to is glitching. This book is in such desperate need of an editor. Like I don't think I've ever read anything that felt more like a rough draft. It is so insanely long. It is way too repetitive, not just in terms of like what I was talking about with repeating those phrases with the ellipses or M dashes, but also just repeating like the same information or like the same scene or like dialogue. And that's why I say it's like 300 pages too long already. All of this information is either unnecessary or just repetition of already unnecessary information. I already brought this up, but the whole Tawny and Kieran thing, I just cannot tolerate it. We haven't really gotten anything about Kieran there has been like no Kieran information, but like Tawny, there was this one point in the book where Hawk and Poppy are like talking and um, Tawny is there or something. And Hawk says like, well, we don't need your maid in here or something. I don't know, maybe it wasn't him, maybe it was someone else, but like, it doesn't matter. Somebody called her a maid. And then Poppy literally says, she's not a maid. And then like three lines later refers to her as her lady's maid. What do you think a lady's maid is? They're a maid. <laughs> she literally had the audacity to sit there and be like, no, she's not a maid. She's a lady's maid. As if that makes it better. <laughs> Just accept the fact that you named your brown character brown and then made her a maid. That's what you did. <laughs> 
The other thing with like her and Hawk, he became like her bodyguard, which was so predictable from literally the second she met him. That's the other thing. Everything about this book is predictable. There, I don't think there's been a single thing that has happened that I haven't been able to guess. Another thing I'm already just going to predict right now, like maybe one, two chapters ago from where I was, she was like reading some book or something and Hawk was like, oh, what do you know about love? And then she was like, well, what do you know about love? Have you ever been in love? And he was like, yes, but that was like ages ago or something. And like the second he said that, I was like, oh, you mean because he's definitely gonna end up being some like immortal being and be like 2000 years old when you're like 18 because we know how much fantasy loves that trope. I'm calling it right now. If he doesn't end up being some like 2000 year old or 200 year old, whatever, hundreds of years old, like immortal being, then I'll delete my YouTube channel. I will literally delete my YouTube channel if that doesn't happen. I promise you that's where this is going. <laughs> Speaking of Hawk, the whole princess thing is really killing me. As you all know, I pretty much despise all pet names. There are like two I can tolerate and then certain circumstances where I'm like, mm, this is like cute, it works for the characters, it's like their thing. The amount of times he has called her princess, which I would like to point out she is not a princess, she is the maiden, which they have said, so many times, back to the whole repetitive thing. They just keep calling her the maiden. She's a virgin, we get it, no one cares. But he just constantly walks around and he's like, yes, princess, okay, princess, as you wish, princess. And I'm like, this is not Princess Bride, okay? Stop it, just stop it. And I cannot tell you how much I feel like this book wants to be Yona of the Dawn. I'm not saying it copied it by any means. There's no way it copied it. Yona of the Dawn actually has plot and developed characters. This has none of those things. So uh, that's not what I'm saying. <laughs> but there are so many similarities in that there is like a princess type figure who has a bodyguard who has to protect her named Hawk who constantly calls her princess. Like that's literally, if that's what you're looking for, go watch Yona of the Dawn. Go read Yona of the Dawn. Stay away from this. There is also like this constant like threat of sexual violence or just like violence against uh, Poppy because she's the maiden. She's not allowed to be touched. She's meant to be like isolated from everybody else and especially men because obviously this is extremely heteronormative. And so because of that, there's just this constant like underlying as well as overt like threat of sexual violence against her. And it's really uncomfortable to read about. And I'm not saying it's not portrayed negatively. Like it is like clearly the book isn't saying like that's okay, but it doesn't like go in depth with that enough to actually like make some kind of commentary on it or for there to be any kind of analysis of that. It's just there. Okay, and then we get into the whole like veil thing. So like, to be honest with you, like I said many times in this video, I don't know what's going on at all in this book. But from what I understand, because she is the maiden, people are not supposed to like see her or like see her face. So she'll wear like a mask or a veil a lot of the time. And so there are very few people who see her without the veil. And there was this whole conversation at one point where Hawk is like with her and she's wearing the veil and he's like, do you always have to wear that and blah, blah, blah. And he was like kind of like implying that she should take it off around him and that she should be like freed from having to like cover herself up. And I don't know if anybody else got this vibe, but it felt very like, hmm, let me free you from your hijab. Like that's what that scene felt like to me. Um, that's what I thought it was implying because what else would that mean in or out of context? I know people are gonna get mad about this and people are gonna argue and say like, well, he was doing it because of this and it's not the same because she's not Muslim or like it's not the same because that's not what, it, it doesn't matter. Books don't exist in vacuums, they exist in our reality and in the world we live in, there are actual veiled women who are constantly told by outside people who do not live their lives, who do not experience their lives, who do not practice the same religion, telling them to take off their veil for their own freedom. That's like an actual issue. And like having that in this book was so out of like nowhere and so weird and uncomfortable and unnecessary, just completely unnecessary. She could have easily just been wearing a mask and have him said something like, you shouldn't have to hide like who you are and people should be allowed to see the real you or something. Having it be a veil and making the whole conversation about freedom has a different connotation. I just cannot explain how infuriated I am by this book because it just makes no sense. Every time I go on Goodreads and I see that this book has a 4.31 out of five stars and like 260 something thousand reviews and it was a 2020 Goodreads Choice Award winner, 
I'm baffled, like absolutely baffled. There is no way, there is no way. And people always get mad at me when I say stuff like this because they think that I'm trying to tell them that they're not allowed to enjoy the book, that they're lesser than if they liked the book, that I think I'm superior because I didn't like it and other people liked it. I don't care if you liked it, like good for you. I probably won't take a recommendation from you because I don't think we're gonna like the same things, but that's literally as far as my opinion of you goes when it comes to reading something like this. Anyway, I'm gonna go try and finish it as fast as possible so I can just finally get to the end, so I can finally be done, so I can finally move on to the next book, which is not a book I'm excited to read either, but at least it won't be any more of this. If I look like I'm deteriorating, it's because I am. I finally got to the smutty scenes, like the first of the smutty scenes, I guess. I'm assuming there's gonna be more. I got to the line where he says, I bet you'll taste as sweet as honeydew. I mean, to be honest with you all, after like, I wanna feel you milking me, baby, like nothing really phases me anymore. <laughs> I will say the second half of this book, the latter 10 hours, I have had much more plot than the first 10 hours. So that's something, but the first 10 hours were quite literally all unnecessary. So the second half has also not been very necessary. Nothing's really going on now either. There was one point where Poppy was like, why do I even have to ascend? What is the point of ascension? No one's even explained that to me. Same, Poppy. No one's explained to me why anything's happening in this book. The romance in this is atrocious. I wouldn't even call it romance. It's not romantic. This whole scene, the scene where he says, I bet you taste like honeydew, so many times before anything even started happening, she was like, I don't want you here. I want you to leave. Go away. We shouldn't do this. I don't want to do this. And I don't care if she like actually wanted it. Why are you having her say that so many times and then still going through with everything else. I rest my case. Like, I think I've said everything there is to say about my feelings about this. I don't think I need to explain anything to you. I feel like I just need to give you the facts. You can form your own opinion and I think you can tell what my opinion is. <laughs> I have like five hours of the audiobook left, so I have to get through the remainder of this before I actually just like give up entirely on life. No, no, okay, no, no, <laughs> absolutely not. <laughs> She is horny because she drank his blood. <laughs> there, 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 there is no way. There's so much to update on. I'm not even finished. I'm not even finished with this book. When will I be finished? Dear God. She just had to drink his blood because surprise, surprise, I don't have to delete my YouTube channel because I was literally right and he's an immortal being. He's an Atlantean or whatever you call it and his blood has healing properties, right? And what else can he do? He can compel people. So she's like dying and wounded and he has to save her life, right? After he's betrayed her because, oh, what else happened? He's working for the dark one. Who could have seen that coming? The only person who didn't see that coming is Poppy because as she has said multiple times in this book, I'm an imbecile, I'm naive, I'm so stupid. Like, yes, you literally are. Anyway, he makes her drink his blood and then what happens? She literally gets horny from drinking his blood. And I can't, I can't take it. I literally have to stop listening because I, I can't. can't. I don't want to be reading this anymore. I'm so tired. <laughs> My list of grievances just keeps getting longer and longer. It's pretty long at this point. First of all, that sex scene, super boring. One of the main things that this book does that I really don't like is that it uses like sexual empowerment as like synonymous for like empowerment and like freedom. Like she's using sex and like being sexual and being like not a virgin anymore to represent like her freedom and her having like autonomy over her own body. And there's literally a line where she says, Hawk wasn't the catalyst for this, he was the reward. Like right before they like have sex for the first time or the only time so far. And that's just not true. Literally the entire plot of this book has happened because you had your first kiss with him. The only reason any plot developments have occurred in this entire book is because she had her first kiss and she wants to sleep with this man. Like good for you girl, sleep with him, but like do not pretend like he wasn't the catalyst, he was the catalyst. It's also not a problem if he was the catalyst, but he was, it wasn't something else. It was you having your first kiss and then being so enamored and obsessed with this man that you were like, I have to have him. 
and now she had him. Good for you. Until he ended up betraying you and then everything went to shit, but like, who could have seen that one coming? Not Poppy, because in her own words, she's an imbecile. I'm just not a fan of the whole, like, losing your virginity and makes you a different person slash, like, gives you more freedom and gives you more autonomy and, like, makes you your true self type of thing, which is the vibe this book has completely. That's one of the main reasons I just, like, can't stand it, because that's, like, just an underlying theme of the entire story. I don't subscribe to that ideology. I think it's flawed and I think it has a lot of problems. Problems. And so like I don't like reading things like that and now her whole world has been turned upside down because he betrayed her And while he has betrayed her he has decided that he's gonna maintain the like flirtatious like sexual like talk with her Like she's clearly very upset that he has betrayed her He literally slept with her and then she found out that his friends and his comrades are responsible for killing someone she cared about and That he was lying to her this entire time and he still has the audacity to sit there and be like, I'm always in the mood for honeydew. Like, disgusting. Go away. <laughs> now she's just horny from the blood. <laughs> and I don't want to be here anymore. I'm literally, I'm going to cry <laughs> from laughter, but I'm going to cry. Like, oh my God. I think of all things, this was the last thing I expected to happen. If this leads to like an actual sex scene, I'm done. I keep saying I'll quit, but like I can't. At this point, I just have to get to the end. I'm so close to the end. Because otherwise, this is my final straw. Like this was my last straw. Getting horny from drinking his blood is my last straw. I'm done. <laughs> I'm so done. I finally, finally finished it. <laughs> She literally stabs him in the heart after finding out that he's Castile and the Dark One. Nobody is shocked by that information. And then runs away thinking that she has killed him because she's still too dumb to figure out that she can't kill him because he's immortal. And then he comes after her. Then they start making out and then they have sex on the floor again. And I get that this is supposed to be some like enemies to lovers thing, but like they're not enemies, they're not lovers, they're both just fucking stupid. <laughs> I just cannot believe I gave so much of my life, I wasted so many hours reading this book and just wasting away my brain cells. I'm gonna call Katie. Are you fine? <laughs> question you don't have thoughts anymore You're no i don't have now i am brain dead now i'm as stupid as poppy i just need the people to know that i finished reading this for you for anybody who comments <laughs> and is like why did you keep reading it if you were so miserable i would like you to say in your own words that <laughs> <laughs> much like most of the content of the book i am so sorry that i didn't finish It wasn't even vaguely, like that's what it was. <laughs> I lost my mind the second she <laughs> she drank his blood and then she was horny. Why? Yeah, I just like why would that be a thing scientifically? My brain hurts so bad. <laughs> Your entire soul. One of the worst things in this entire book, not actually, but like one of the sm one of the smaller things that is just the worst is the fact that she named the vampires vampires. <laughs> at this point. Mm -hmm. yeah. I, I have ascended. I've ascended at this point. I'm not here anymore. <laughs> I am no, not I here. Ascended, you descended. I have descended. Oh, I've descended into hell. I'm so sorry, but thank you. <laughs> I just, the people needed this from you, you know? They did. Did they? Did they really? <laughs> yeah. If I read it, you had to read it, you know? It is your GWS feminist outlook on it, you know? <laughs> There was no feminism in this book. <laughs> this book left its feminism at the fucking door. This is what friends are for. I just need you to suffer, you know? Wait, I love you. Thank you. <laughs> anyway, that's it. Those are all of my thoughts on From Blood and Ash. This book has taken decades off my life. I can't even believe that 
it's in my brain now. And this is like something I have absorbed and taken in and have information about. One out of five stars, zero out of five stars. If I could give it zero stars, I would give it zero stars. Right now, this is my least favorite book I have ever read. Easily the worst book I've read this year. That's all I really have to say. This was a sacrifice <laughs> that I have made of my time, energy, and brain cells, all of which I will unfortunately never get back. Okay, next up, I read an author that people have also been begging me to read for years, and that is none other than Colleen Hoover. Specifically, I read Slammed. I know this is not her most popular book. I know that this is not the book that people have been asking me specifically to read for a really long time, but I'll explain in the clip why this is the book I chose to read and why this was the book I didn't want to read and everything that it's about. All right, hello everyone. I just finished reading slammed. This was my first Colleen Hoover book. It's literally impossible to go online and not see her books. They're everywhere. I've never been interested in reading her books. Back when I first started booktube she was still, I would say honestly, just as popular, but I remember seeing a lot more about slammed at that time and the reason I never wanted to read slammed was because I knew it was about a teacher-student relationship and I don't like reading about teacher-student relationships, especially if they're romanticized. And not just any teacher-student relationship, not that I want to read about any of them, um, but this one is set in high school, which which makes it 10 times worse for me. But here we are, years later, and I have read it, and oh my god, I hate it. <laughs> Nobody here is surprised. Uh, this was the book that I knew on this list going into it. I knew I was gonna hate this. There was no way I was gonna like this. So for anyone who doesn't know or doesn't remember if you read the book a really long time ago, Slammed is about this 18-year-old girl named Lakin, but she is in high school. Please keep that in mind. She's 18. She just turned 18 two weeks ago. She and her family have just moved to a new town, to a new state, and she's starting school at a new school, doesn't really know anybody. She meets their next door neighbor who's this like hot older guy. He's 21 years old so he is only a few years older than her but she is 18 so technically it's legal. She's enamored with him. They've known each other for three days please keep this in mind. And then they go out on a date and then they kiss on this date. She like really likes him. Then a couple days go by and she goes to school. She hasn't seen him since that date and she goes to her poetry class and what does she find out? He is her teacher. Shocking. So now they have to navigate this new problem in their relationship. They've known each other for three days. I just need to emphasize that. That is so important to this story. And then everything just kind of continues on from there. So first thing I'm gonna say, I don't really care about the age gap. It is like only a few years. What I care about is the fact that she just turned 18. She is still in high school still in high school, that makes a big difference, and he is her teacher. The reason that neither of them knew this, that he was her teacher and that she was still in high school, is because um, they'd known each other for three days, and his excuse was that she just seemed mature for her age during this date that like lasted the first like several chapters of this book. Like it was a long first date and plenty of time to talk. Not once did the conversation of what do you do come up for her. She never asked him what he does. He's an adult. He could have a job or he could be in school. Like she didn't ask and never once did the fact that she's in high school come up. If you're a high school teacher and you know someone moved in next to you and they're a teenager, even if they're 18, you don't just automatically assume that they're in college. You could easily assume she's still in high school. She literally lives right next to you in the same neighborhood. Clearly she's in the same school district that you work at. Like it's not a realistic excuse to say that you didn't know, she just seemed mature for her age. Like that's the oldest excuse in the book. Shut up, you're a creep. <laughs> he's supposed to be the adult who's in control of this situation because he's the teacher. He's the one who should be responsible for this. He never takes responsibility for it. And the book tries so hard to make him seem like he's the good guy. He's such a good person. He's trying so hard to work through this. There is nothing to work through. You're her teacher. She's a student in your class. I don't care that he's young. I don't care that she's of legal age. It's still wrong. <laughs> I didn't update as I was reading it because I read it really fast. It's pretty short, but I took a lot of notes, so you can't see that, but we're gonna go through all of these. <laughs> First, I wanna talk about the writing. I don't hate the writing, uh, which is why I say that I could potentially read another book by Colleen Hoover. Do I think I will like the content of her books in general? No, I don't think they're for me, but I don't think she's a bad writer. This is also maybe because I've been reading so many books where I hated the writing back to back to back that I'm just comparing it to those. So by comparison, the writing seems like completely fine to me, even good at times. And maybe if I read a couple other books and then went back and like read some of her books 
books again, I'd be like, no, never mind. I don't like the writing. But right now, I, I don't think her writing is bad. I will say though, the dialogue, cringy at a lot of moments. This first thing that I have noted down in my notes, she literally says, is he for real? A hot guy who makes me laugh and loves poetry? Someone pinch me. Like there were moments like that where I'm like, this is, eh, this is kind of cringy. But apart from that, the actual writing I thought was pretty decent. There was this one line where she was talking about her friend, I think her name was Eddie that she met. And she's talking about Eddie and her boyfriend. And she says they could pass for brother and sister, which is such a weird weird comment to make. Like, I know this is, this is very random, but that's such a weird comment to make about people who are dating. Why would you say that? It was uncomfortable. <laughs> oh my God. Then there's this other part where she says, quote, the fact that the boy I was falling in love with is now my teacher. He's not a boy. He's not a boy. He's 21. He's 21 with a full-time job. That is a full-grown man who should be taking responsibility for the situation, except he doesn't because he acts like a boy. Also, like I mentioned, he is the poetry teacher and he does like slam poetry. Obviously that's why the book is called Slammed. So slam poetry is like a huge part of this. And there's so many times where he's like performing his slam poetry for them in class. And like, if I were sitting in this class and I just sit through my teacher performing slam poetry for us, I would walk out, I would leave. I literally had a teacher in high school who would perform his poetry for us who would read his poetry to us out loud in class when we were in like a psych class we weren't even in English class and it was the cringiest thing ever so this was literally giving me flashbacks to that yeah it was awful I don't want to hear you perform your slam poetry for the class that's cringy inherently it's cringy also the poems were bad oh my god at one point when her mom finally finds out about their relationship she literally says like this could ruin his career slash reputation like he's the one who should be responsible in this situation. Why are you blaming your own daughter? Like she's not the one who's responsible. She tried to like get out of his class after he asked her to. And then he was like, no, never mind. I'm sorry about what I said. You can stay in my class, blah, blah, blah. Like he's the one who keeps giving her mixed signals and confusing her even more because he is the manipulative one because he is the one who should be responsible. And he's the adult choosing to date someone in high school. Why are you blaming your own daughter for his crime, literal crime? because it is a crime. Then at one point her mom confronts him and then Lakin says, two adults hashing it out in front of the children. That's what this felt like. That's what it is. They are two adults. I don't care that she's 18. She turned 18 two weeks ago. Those are two adults, two actual adults with actual adult jobs who are not in high school, hashing it out in front of a child because you are still a child. Oh my God. Like everything about this was trying to justify everything that was happening. And you cannot justify any of this. There's no justification here. He's a teacher, you're a student that it doesn't work, get over it. It was all just so unbelievably dramatic and they were acting like they had been together for years. And then like this happened and now they suddenly can't be together. You have known each other for three days, three days. You're literally just creating problems for yourself at this point and for everyone else because this is literally a crime that has serious repercussions. At one point she was literally like, I can drop out of high school and get my GED. Drop out of high school. You have known him for three days. You went on one date, he kissed you like twice and you're ready to drop out of high school? For what? For what? Oh my God. I cannot, I cannot wrap my mind around it. And their whole like relationship, they're like technically not together this entire time, but it's a very blurred line situation where like he's clearly leading her on sometimes. There are like stolen like touches and like moments and stuff like that that are clearly very inappropriate. So they're not technically together but like it's not it's not good <laughs> anyway at one point she gets into like a fight with her mom and then she goes over to his house because they're next door neighbors she's like crying and then this man whose name is will by the way he literally has the audacity to say to her mom let her stay julia she needs me right now Bitch, you're her teacher. Get her the fuck out of your house. Oh my God. I'm getting so heated over this because like there's no way you sat there and thought, yes, let me write about this teacher student relationship that is highly inappropriate. That is a serious thing that a lot of people face and let me romanticize it. Why? What was the reason? What did this achieve? Like I, what what was the goal here? That sometimes teacher-student relationships are okay? That sometimes the lines are blurred? No, no, 
It's not that hard to stay away from someone that you've known for three days who is your teacher. He also kept talking about how like this whole situation was such a big deal to him because he doesn't want to lose his job, his uh, place at school or his little brother. And every single time he talks about this, he's like, yeah, I like had to leave football and leave my football scholarship behind and go through school like so quickly so I could get this job so I could raise my brother and protect my brother. It's all for my brother, blah, 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 blah. I left my girlfriend at the time, like when he was 19 or something. If it was so serious to you that you had to take care of your brother and you have to do all of this to make sure your brother is safe and protected, why would you risk it all for a high school girl? Answer, like I want an answer. Why would you risk it all for a girl in high school? There's no like spark that you have with someone that is that much more important than the well-being of your little brother who you claim to care about so much that you were willing to leave your football scholarship and like everything else behind years ago. But now you're willing to risk all of that for some random girl in high school that you met three days ago. There's no explanation for this. It's just nonsense. <laughs> Then of course we had to have a scene um, with S.A. and where he has to come in and save her from um, what's happening to her because there's no way this book could miss out on that. But then what makes it worse actually is, so what's happening in this scene is this guy is kissing her against her will and then Will, the teacher, comes and pulls him off of her and like starts beating him up but he's a student. So clearly this is gonna cause some issues. And she thinks that like Will did this to like help her. No, we find out later from Will, he literally only did this because he was jealous. He didn't even know she was being like hurt. He literally just saw another guy kissing her and was like, no, I can't have that and beat him up. So you weren't even trying to protect her or help her. You were just jealous. That's so much worse. Oh my God, like I, I cannot explain how like every single event that happened in this book made it just so much substantially worse than it was before. Like it's so bad. Also, can I just say, I hate the fact that his name is Will. We already have one terribly questionable fictional teacher named Will. We don't need another one. Will Schuster was enough for society. I don't need this Will too. You can take him back. There was literally one line where he was like, don't make me the bad guy like you are the bad guy you are accept it you're the bad guy there is no other way around this i don't care what anyone says he is the villain of this story i understand that this book is trying to be taboo i understand that colleen hoover's whole thing is just being taboo but like there's taboo and then there's like criminal and before someone's like taboo does mean criminal sometimes it i don't care you cannot romanticize a high schooler dating their teacher pretty little liars did enough of that enough of that damage for us as children okay i watched that at like 13 years old being like yeah ezra and Arya should totally be together. Not processing the fact that she's 16 and he's 25 or 24. The more people write about things like this or create things like this and just make them seem like they're okay or that it's just such a hard relationship to be in, the more people are actually going to fall victim to these types of situations. I understand that it's fiction, but fiction also has real life ramifications. Obviously anyone can write what they want, but you also have to consider the effect that that is going to have. I feel like she tried to age him down to make it seem like it was like a little bit more acceptable, but like it doesn't matter. It's the fact that you like hold this position over somebody. That's what makes it so wrong. It's not just about the age gap. And I think the more stories that we create like this, that romanticize these types of relationships, the more and more harm these relationships can actually do in real life and the more prevalent they will become and the more just normalized they will be. And I think that that's a serious consequence of writing stuff like this. And I think that that's something that we all need to consider when we consume stories like this or we write stories about taboo subjects. And like technically by definition it would be taboo, but it is also a crime. And I'm not talking about like legality, I'm talking about like it's an abuse of power. Like that's what it is. Like you are harming another person. That's what I mean when I say it's criminal. Like you're harming another person. And that's just fundamentally wrong. And I think if you want to write or read about taboos, that's totally fine and cool. But like there's a difference between using abuse as a taboo. This is just like abuse being normalized and romanticized. And I think that that's 
highly problematic. Anyway, I'm just glad I'm finished with this and that I don't have to read it again or ever think about it again. I gave this, I think, 1.25 out of five stars. It's probably just like honestly a one. The only reason I like this more than From Blood and Ash is because the writing isn't as bad. The story itself, I think, is fundamentally more problematic. I just, I hated it. One of my least favorite books I've ever read. All right, lastly, I read the one book, if there was one book that everyone has been asking me to read more than any book, it is this one. And that is A Court of Thorns and Roses by Sarah J Maas. I don't have to explain to you what this is. Everybody has read this book, um, except me until now, but I'll explain more in the clip why I said I would never read this. Um, and you'll finally see my reaction to this book. After years of waiting, here is your reward. <laughs> Hello everyone. We have arrived to the moment you've all been waiting for. It's finally happening. I'm currently about halfway through the book, a little bit less than halfway through the book. I'm on like chapter 19 or something. And I haven't updated until now because quite honestly, I have no thoughts. Nothing has really happened and I'm like, 150, more than 150 pages into this book, 166 pages into the book. Finally, things have kind of started to happen. The only thought I'm really having is that this reads like a Sarah J Mass book, which clearly it is. <laughs> to give you a little bit of backstory on my relationship with Sarah J Mass books, I started reading the Throne of Glass series in 2015 or 16. I read the first three books and I liked the first two a lot, didn't care about the third one very much, and then I read Queen of Shadows and I didn't like it. And then I read Empire of Storms when that one came out and I really hated that one. So ever since then I have talked about how I don't really like Sarah J Mass's books. I'm aware of how popular she is. I'm aware of how much her fans love to go after people when they criticize even the smallest thing about any of her books. I've known this for years. They have hated me for years. <laughs> I have literally received many a death threat because I said that I don't like the Throne of Glass series. And so because I didn't like her other books, I didn't continue with the um, Throne of Glass series. So I never read the last two books. And then I decided that I was never going to read the Akatar series because I don't like her writing and I don't like her stories. Plus I've heard so many people talk about them. I know basically the general plot of the first two. I don't know the plot. I just like kind of know like what happens in general. I have definitely been spoiled for parts of this. People have been begging me to read them ever since I read Throne of Glass, but I've never wanted to because I just know I'm not gonna like it. But here we are years later, past me never would have guessed that we'd be here. I have started reading it and I will finish it. At what cost? I do not know yet. <laughs> My biggest gripe with her books is the gender essentialism and the like mates thing. Every single time she writes about these like mates or like faded relationships, whatever, I just like cannot stand them. And I know it's not just her. This is a common trope that's in um, a lot of Faye stories. So it's not exclusive to her, which is why I don't really read a lot of stories about Faye because I just don't like this very much. But the way she writes about like men and women, which she refers to as males and females, I just cannot tolerate. It's gender essentialism, which if you don't know, it's just the idea that gender is an essential like biological thing that is born in people and there are certain things that make somebody a man versus a woman and I don't subscribe to that idea. I don't believe that gender is binary and I don't believe that gender is essential either but her like relationships and romances hinge on that. That is an essential part of those relationships because people have like a male scent and a female scent and there's just like a lot of like omega verse in this as well which like it's just not my thing. So I just don't think I'm gonna like it. And I'm sorry already to all of the Sarah J Mass stands out there who are gonna come after me. I know, I know you're waiting to write your hate comments, I know. But so far in the first like 150 or so-ish pages, there hasn't been that much of that, which is nice. So at least my least favorite thing has not been that big of a deal. The writing has been very Sarah J Mass in style, which is not really my favorite. Like there was this one part, the only thing I've marked so far in the entire book. She does this thing, which was also super common in From Blood and Ash, except Jennifer L. Armentrout used ellipses and Sarah J Mass uses M dashes. Honestly, it doesn't really make a difference. It's annoying either way, but she does this thing where she constantly repeats herself essentially with like an M dash and I'll just read you examples. This is three times on the same half a page. This is all within this just chunk right here. South, M dash. All I had to do was go south. Now, M dash, I had to go now. Food, M dash, getting food. Like she does that, like, I don't know how to explain it. Like she's just repeating herself. And then if I just go over to the next page, it was laden with food and wine, M dash, so much food. 
I lingered by the threshold, gazing at the food, M dash, all that hot, glorious food. Like, it's just constant repetition. That's why the books are so long. It's like you're not actually getting anything out. There's no information that we're learning. There's no plot development. It's literally just repeating the same things over and over and over again. I find this just like so distracting while I'm reading because it's just constant like interruptions in thought. It just makes the book feel like unedited to me. I will say though, From Blood and Ash was worse when it came to this. I've never seen something repeat itself that many times and this has done it less I will say but it's definitely in it and it's definitely noticeable enough but yeah anyway so far those are really the only thoughts I have on the book I don't feel any way in particular about Feyre or Tamlin I don't have any opinion of them I know they're gonna get together I don't think there's gonna be like any build up to that we're just suddenly going to like each other and sleep together like that's a hundred percent what's gonna happen so like I said I know who she ends up with ultimately so that ultimately will have some kind of influence on my opinion of this going into it already knowing where it's headed but when it comes to this one alone like I don't actually know what happens in this book this will be a complete surprise I feel like if I were to read A Court of Mist and Fury I'd be less surprised because I know what happens in that book better I thought that from the beginning I was going to despise this but I don't um I just I don't have any opinion of it at all yet we'll see from here I feel like things are finally going to start to pick up and I'll have more thoughts on it okay literally the second that I said this book hasn't gotten into any of the mating stuff we just got into the mating stuff so that's fun. And she is also now thanking him for not enslaving her. I don't know if that's something we really need to be thanking people for, as if the best thing that somebody could possibly do for you is not make you their slave. Um, okay. I know that a lot of people don't like Tamlin. I don't think we're really supposed to. I don't know if it's by the end of this book or like in later books or something. I don't think we're really supposed to like be rooting for him all the time. I don't think I'm gonna be rooting for anyone in this book if I'm being honest, but like thanking someone for not enslaving you, the bar is really low if that's the case. I can't. Anyway, I'm gonna go, I'm gonna go read the rest of it. <laughs> Okay, hello. I have a quick question for anybody who has read the rest of the books. We were just introduced to some new high fae who I'm pretty sure is gonna be Resand or Rysand, whatever, based on the description of his character. But the first thing that he says to Feyre, so like she's basically being like attacked by these fairies and he like swoops in to save her and he says, there you are, I've been looking for you. Is that a reference to Hal's moving castle? Because that's literally what Hal says to Sophie the first time he sees her when she's being harassed by those soldiers. Are Feyre and Rhysan supposed to be like Howl and Sophie? I mean, no one will compare to them, but like, is that what this is supposed to be referencing? Because there's no way that's not a reference. That's exactly what he says to her. The way that I know this is Rhysan, even though they haven't said that it's him, is because of his description. It says his short black hair gleamed like raven's feathers, offsetting his pale skin and blue eyes so deep they were violet. I've seen so many images of Rhysan on the internet, all against my own will. <laughs> I know this is supposed to be him. And can I just say, I I know this is petty, but like, this man is not hot. If I saw him, if this picture specifically, especially, if I saw this man looking at me, I would run the other way. Immediately, just like bolts in the opposite direction. He's terrifying. First of all, he low-key looks 40. I know that he's supposed to be like 200 years old or something, but he looks like old. Isn't Fair like 19? He looks conniving, like he's always like plotting something, like he's trying to like manipulate people around him. He looks like that. Maybe he's not like that, I don't know. I haven't like really gotten to know him as a character. That's the vibe visually that he gives me. Fair describes him as the most beautiful man she'd ever seen. Personally, I think he's terrifying. <laughs> Let me look up Tamlin. I don't even know what he's supposed to look like. Is Tamlin blonde? Did I miss that this entire time? This is what Tamlin is supposed to look like? No way. These are the men we're thirsting after? No way. <laughs> hey. It's like he's trying to look like Legolas, but like he can't. <laughs> It's the way that all of these characters have exactly the same face and bone structure with just different colored hair and eyes. Like they all look technically exactly the same. <laughs> Actually, you know what? This kind of adds to my Hell's Moving Castle theory because if he's supposed to be blonde, Tamlin is supposed to be blonde, and then Rhysand is supposed to have black hair. This is like when Howl goes from having his blonde hair to his black hair, except we're actually using two different people this time. And it represents like how he has like changed as a person. And I feel like she's just using two different people to accomplish that same thing. <laughs> if Lucian is a ginger, then I'm gonna lose my mind. Hold on. Is he? No way. Oh my god. Okay. 
Okay, I stand by this theory. This is supposed to be Howl's Moving Castle fan fiction. It's not good Howl's Moving Castle fan fiction, but it is Howl's Moving Castle fan fiction. Tamlin is blonde, like blonde Howl. He's the first one that Sophie meets. Then we meet Lucian who has like orangey red hair. Like when Howl's hair accidentally gets dyed orange and then he has his whole meltdown and Lucian is definitely like the most dramatic of all of the characters so far. And then we have Resand who gets introduced and he has dark jet black hair. All of these men are just supposed to be Howl in his different forms. Honestly, that means that I should like it more because Howl's Moving Castle is like my favorite movie, but I'm not really so far, but I fully stand by this theory. There's no way the three of them have those three hair colors. She meets them in that order and personality wise, they kind of match up with Howl in his different forms. You cannot change my mind. That's what this is. Okay, things have escalated a little and there is way too much growling and biting in this book for me. I mean, that's not surprising, but I don't like Tamlin. I know that ultimately he's not gonna be like her main love interest cause like Resand exists, but like, if she's gonna sleep with him after this, after what he just pulled, after biting her neck and being like, don't ever disobey me again. No, I, I've had enough. All right, hello everyone. Uh, welcome to another day of me reading Akatar. A lot has happened since I've updated, but I'm gonna save that for later. Right now, I wanna talk about this riddle that Farah just got from Amarantha that she has to solve in order to free herself and Tamlin. And I'm calling it right now, the answer to this riddle is love. Farah has been contemplating this for like at least days at this point. She's been trying to figure out the answer to this riddle and she still hasn't figured it out. So technically I don't know what the answer is yet. I could be wrong, but like I'm I'm 100% certain the answer to this riddle is love. It's so obvious. <laughs> I'm a huge sucker for riddles in books. I love riddles. I love trying to solve riddles. They're really fun for me. But like this one is too easy for her to be thinking about this for so many days. This is the riddle. There are those who seek me a lifetime, but never we meet. And those I kiss, but who trample me beneath ungrateful feet. At times I seem to favor the clever and the fair, but I bless all those who are brave enough to dare. By large, my ministrations are soft handed and sweet, but scorned, I become a difficult beast to defeat. For though each of my strikes lands a powerful blow, when I kill, I do it slow. Love. The answer is love. There's no way this girl is sitting in her prison cell with nothing else to do, contemplating only this, and she still hasn't been able to put it together. Everything about this entire situation is about love. In order to break the curse, she had to say she loved Tamlin. Amarantha wants Tamlin to love her. Also, this is House Moving Castle fan fiction. What is the whole theme of that? The whole heart's a heavy burden thing. It's love. It's about love and like a heart. The answer is love. Like Feyre, girl, please, you can figure this out. I, I don't really have faith in you, but like you should be able to figure this out. <laughs> also back to my whole Howl's Moving Castle thing. My entire review for this book is not even gonna be a review. It's just gonna be me trying to prove my point that this book is based off of Howl's Moving Castle because it is. Like the fact that Amarantha wants Tamlin and curses him in order to try and make him love her. It's the exact same thing that the Witch of the Waste does to Howl by like cursing him and taking his heart because he wouldn't love her. It's literally the same. It's just trying to be Howl's Moving Castle. That is what this book is trying to do. I'm not saying I'm gonna read all of the other books. I'm not saying that. But I feel like if I were to read all of the other books, I could make a very in-depth analysis on why A Court of Thorns and Roses, the entire series is literally just based off of Howl's Moving Castle because it is. Anyway, I'm gonna keep reading to find out if I'm right about the answer to this riddle, even though I already know I am, but we'll see how long it takes Feyre to figure it out because I feel like it's gonna be a while. I feel like she's not gonna figure out the answer until the very end. Okay, Reese literally has to be Howl because his like animal form or whatever he can shapeshift into is literally a bird man thing. Like he's, he's just Howl, like. <sighs> Okay, listen, I know he probably doesn't like actually mean this because he's probably just doing it for his cover or whatever, but this line is just like so disgusting. She's like, what do you want with me anyway? And he says, why does any male need a reason to enjoy the presence of a female? Like gross, just gross. Like again, like I said, I know he probably doesn't like actually mean that because as we know, Reese is supposed to be everyone's like feminist king or whatever. That's just like the way the characters like talk about gender and sex in general, they're always just like, oh, why would a male care about this when a female is doing this? Like the male body, male presence, female hands, female scent, like the, the, all the random like gendered things that don't need to be gendered and the, just the use of the words male and female 
or it's just gross to me and I hate it. I just wish that that wasn't in here because if it wasn't in here, I would have so much more fun with this. I'm not gonna lie, it's a little bit fun. By far, I am enjoying this one more than I'm enjoying any of the other books that I've read in this video. In the greatest turn of events, this book has been the most fun for me. Does that mean it's good or that I really like it? No, but it is kind of like trashy fun. So I get it. I just wish the like male female stuff wasn't in here and the like claiming language, the weird predatory nature and like language when it comes to sex and relationships. And I understand that it's part of like the whole Faye thing. But again, I don't like it personally, which is why I don't really read it. So we just met the very first character of color in this entire book and immediately, she kills him. Some things do not change. <laughs> Literally the first character, a brown-skinned high fey male, who we then find out is the high lord of the summer court. Yes, the high lord of the summer court. And then Amarantha orders Reese to kill him. And he does, within one page. All he said was please, and like begged for his life, basically, or begged for death. I don't know what he's begging for, but he's begging and he's like sobbing. It's been way too long since I've read Throne of Glass for me to remember exactly, but I do remember this being an issue I had with that series as well. And before all of the stands get mad at me, I haven't read the other books, so I don't know if there are more characters of color. All I can judge is that there is this one book and she has had one character of color and then kills him off on the next page. That's all I am judging. I'm not talking about the rest of the series. I don't know what else is in the rest of the series. All I know is this, and this was not great. He just licked away her tears, licked them away. This is about Reese. That's literally gross. What? Five minutes after I said that this was kind of fun and I'm having like a little bit of a good time, surprisingly. I take that back. Listen, I know he's supposed to be like the villain in this one and like creepy and weird, but like, I'm not gonna like him later. Like, how are you supposed to redeem him in my eyes? When he licked her tears away, when she hates him and it's like revolted by him. I'm revolted. I can't, oh God. Tamlin literally has a heart made of stone. This is Howl's Moving Castle. Are you kidding me? It's exactly the same thing, like how Howl doesn't have a heart because he removed his heart, so Calcifer is his actual heart. He doesn't have a heart because his heart was replaced with stone. Nothing will ever change my mind. She took so many components from that story to make this one. Oh my God. I know I haven't even gotten to this whole thing yet, but I know there's like that, um, like rattle the stars line. And there are a bunch of quotes about stars and starlight. It's literally like how Sophie's hair turns um, silver. And then Hal tells her your hair is beautiful. It looks like starlight. Like you can't, oh my God. It's literally just Hal's moving castle. I'm I'm losing my mind. I was right. The answer to the riddle is love. I could have told you that like seven chapters ago, Farah. I don't know how it took you literal months to figure out the answer to this riddle. At least she finally got it, but who knows if Amaranth is actually gonna set them free. We'll see. I have like 10 pages of this book left. I'll be back once I'm done. <laughs> okay, I'm sorry, I'm still not at the end, but I have to update again because some of this imagery is literally just so similar to Howl's Moving Castle. So like, I don't exactly know how we got here, but like some part of her heart or her soul or whatever like left her body. And then Tamlin is like going to put it back in her body. It says his hand glowed bright as the rising sun and in the center of his palm, that strange shining bud formed. I love you, he whispered, and he kissed me as he laid his hand on my heart, like putting it back into her heart, into her chest. That's literally exactly what Sophie does when he puts Howl's heart into his chest again. The imagery is the same. I know I've said it a million times at this point, but that is what this is. That is what all of these moments and scenes and everything and all the lines are referencing. It's all references to Howl's Moving Castle, not just references, it's, it's Howl's Moving Castle fic. That is what this book is. I think I only have one chapter left, so I'll be back shortly. <laughs> I finished it. <laughs> First of all, can we have a moment of silence um, for the fact that I actually read A Quarter Thorns and Roses? What universe are we living in? <laughs> Hang on, I'm gonna put the cover on for full effect. <laughs> okay, my general overall thoughts. I honestly liked this a lot more than I thought I would. Do I think it's good? 
No. <laughs> I think I was expecting this to make me feel the way that From Blood and Ash made me feel, which was just utterly terrible and like unreadable. This was not unreadable. I read it pretty quickly. I took a break in between reading it and read several other books, but like the actual amount of time I spent reading it was really not that long. It probably took me like one to two days to read in total. I don't know how to describe this exactly, but I think that like the aesthetic that has been assigned to this book, if you've seen like any fan art um, or edits or anything of Akatar, then I think you know like what I'm talking about when I talk about its general like aesthetic. I feel like that aesthetic doesn't really match up with the way that like I personally like felt while I was reading it. I feel like in my head everything looks really different than the way I'm used to seeing people depict it online. I'm not saying one is right or wrong, it's just in my head it doesn't really look like that exactly. But I mean that in like a positive way. I actually liked the feeling of reading the book and like the feeling of the atmosphere in the book more than the atmosphere and aesthetic that's portrayed in the edits that I see of the books, if that makes any sense. But in the biggest plot twist of the century, this is my favorite book I've read in this entire video. I say favorite. It's a low bar and we're comparing it to some of the worst books I think I've ever read. Do I like Akatar? No, but I don't hate it either. I feel kind of the same way that I felt about Red Queen. It was just like, okay. And there were things about it that like made me want to keep reading or things that just kind of made me curious. Honestly, like, I don't really know what to say. It's just like, okay, like it's fine. I have a decent amount of questions and I really want to know how we get to certain plot points that I already know about. Honestly, like I shouldn't be that surprised because if we look at my relationship with previous Sarah J Maas books, I always like her first two books. I don't really like the third one and then I hate the next ones. And I feel like the same thing is going to happen with this series. I feel like this one was just okay to me. I feel like I might actually kind of like A Court of Mist and Fury and then I just won't like the rest of them. If I know myself and I feel like I do fairly well when it comes to my reading I'm pretty sure that's what will happen if I were to read the rest of the series, which I'm not going to do So please do not ask me to I'm not gonna read all of them I cannot do that to myself <laughs> for an overall rating I think I'd probably give this about like two and a half stars I wouldn't really recommend this necessarily and I wouldn't say I liked it I just didn't hate reading it which are two very different things My biggest takeaway is just that this is Howl's Moving Castle fic like that's all I can really say I really want to know other people's thoughts on that if that is like a common theory within the fandom or not because it it should be if if it isn't because it's huge everyone should know that this is based on Howl's Moving Castle because it is I don't care what anyone says even if Sarah J Maas were to come out and say no it's not based on Howl's Moving Castle it is it's literally just based on Howl's Moving Castle <laughs> I won't believe anybody anyway I'm glad we actually ended on what can be considered for this video at least a high note because I was really not feeling it for a while there and this one was at least at the very least readable but there you all have it that completes me reading five books I said I would never read <laughs> this was such an experience. Honestly, it was both exhausting and also kind of fun. <laughs> for the most part, I don't think I was really surprised in this. I feel like this kind of solidified for me that I really just do know my taste very well and I know what I will and will not like. I am, however, surprised that I liked some books more than I anticipated and I hated some books even more than I thought I would. So that was interesting. <laughs> but I hope you all enjoyed watching this video. If you'd like to follow me on any of my social media, all of my links are in the description box as always. If you want to keep up with what I'm reading, I am both on Goodreads and Storygraph at A Clockwork Reader so you can see what books I'm currently reading and also I update on my Instagram a lot so you can follow me there too. I have way more content coming your way, more experiment videos that I've planned out coming your way. I apologize that sometimes they take me a really long time to film but I hope you all are okay with that because I just want to make sure that I make them the best I can and that I include as many of my thoughts as possible and I hope you're okay with the longer videos because I cannot talk less than this. I have already cut out so much I can't cut out more. <laughs> but again thank you all so much for watching this video. I hope you enjoyed and I will see you in my next video. Bye!